Good morning, colleagues, and welcome to our session on international work. Uh, the purpose of this session is to look at what uh, the post-16 HMI have picked up that might be useful in the land of blended learning or technology-supported learning uh, from other countries, other areas that might be helpful in our own planning, in our own delivery, uh, and for our learners generally, uh, so that we can plan a better experience. Um, the, there'll be a lot of uh, references given here uh, because there might be particular examples you may want to follow up on. During the presentation, if you have any questions, do raise your hand, but it's probably more helpful in the short term to put them in the chat, and I'll try and pick them up, and we can follow them in the discussion uh, at the end. Uh, I'm going to hand now uh, over to Ian Beach, my colleague uh, from HMI, uh, who's prepared the presentation uh, and is ready uh, to, to share his wisdom on international experience. Ian, over to you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning to everyone. Um, as John said, I've tried to gather messages from international experiences. Um, after reflecting on the presentation, it's, it's actually come out mainly American and North American. Um, I don't know whether that's just where I was looking or where, or where that is where most of the activity is now, but I, I hope you find it useful. And I think Kenji is going to share the slides with us just now. So Kenji is in charge of the slides. So I'll just say next slide, please. And the main uh, themes for this session, as you may have seen from the abstract, is looking at the challenges that the environment presents, any lessons learned from UK nations or further afield, how we might address these challenges or how they are being addressed, and in the discussion session, share our thoughts on what leaders and managers might learn about how to manage uh, institutions in this difficult time. Next slide, please. As we know, the COVID pandemic has created a very swift and significant change of direction for colleges in Scotland. And um, this has become a challenge in terms of trying to keep everyone connected, particularly as they're like myself in, in odd rooms of the house or, or or trying to get Wi-Fi connections as best they can. The next slide, please. So going through these slides, I've picked out particular highlights that I'll just briefly discuss, but most of the slides have got a, um, a hyperlink or a link to them where you can go to these resources and um, access them when you get the, the, the full slide deck at the end of the presentation. One thing that came across to me as I was looking through this research activity was this phrase Maslow before Bloom, which I found quite interesting in that um, it, unless you can meet the basic needs of individuals, learners and staff, um, it's very difficult to move on from the Maslow's hierarchy into Bloom's taxonomy. And I think this is this came through particularly um, strong when I, when I was looking at this the, these, these documents and doing this research. So making sure people's needs are met, personalise the um, the um, activities and also make sure people are safe and their data is safe and put a bit of faith in educators knowing what uh, what to do at the end of the day. And I think that's that has become apparent in what we've, what we've done across the colleges in Scotland. Next slide, please. So looking at um, one source of uh, webinars I found very helpful was the Chronicle of Higher Education. And I think this may be why this, um, presentation slightly skewed towards colleges in, in North America or, or the United States. They seem to be in a very similar position to ourselves regarding the profile of learners, um, maybe working in, in communities with, with, with diverse backgrounds and, and, and differences in backgrounds of learners. And they seem also be, to be fairly stretched financially. So I, I found that, um, you know, that there was quite a, 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 a symbiosis, I feel like, between between our colleges in Scotland and those in, in North America. But they were talking when I looked at, at this, uh, their sort of activities about meeting basic needs. A lot of the population is affected by reduced wages or job losses. Just like ourselves, the vulnerable learners are made more vulnerable. Um, colleges there are offering a lot of wraparound services and the college is often the first place learners go to for some of these services you know, financial support, mental health support, et cetera. And most of the, their colleges are seeing a declining enrolment. 
Next slide, please. So in Montgomery College there, they, they saw falling recruitment and they, they, they sort of surveyed learners. And I was quite surprised by this, but they were saying that in their, in their sort of constituency, learners couldn't even commit to a 15 week set of classes. They were able, or they could see maybe seven weeks ahead and they would be willing to sign up to that. But in terms of the sort of offering that we have in colleges, you know, a six to seven week block or course, um, you know, would maybe seem a bit strange, but um, that, that, that was something that sort of surprised me really. Um, maybe it shouldn't surprise me, but um, that may be the way things, that, that may be the way we have to start thinking in the future. Um, certainly making decisions early was a big advantage. Um, using partnerships to amplify the impact of support services. And this terminology of micro-credentials where they were developing much shorter programs, I'd say about six, seven weeks, but where learners could leave with something that would either help them to get to the next phase of their learning, they've got something in the bag, they can move on, or maybe to employment. Um, and also a realization that probably not everyone is going to want to come back onto campus post COVID and very much in the mode there of thinking about future models of delivery. Next slide, please. Here's another sort of um, sort of spin on it, if you like, the now, the dance, the transformation, the links at the bottom, but talking about, you know, not trying to fight what's happened, but sort of go with the flow and build new models. And I think that's where we are starting to get to now in Scottish colleges with the vaccine becoming available. Um, thinking about what happens in you know, 21, 22, 22, 23, et cetera. We're certainly looking at strengthening uh, leadership systems, accelerating the development of learning teams. And as I've just been talking about um, from those previous slides, having a serious look at timetables and calendars for the, for, for the year. Next slide, please. Um, Here's a, a few a couple of slides with quotes from from I think it was mainly a lecturer at the University of Oregon, talking about being thrust into um, delivering online courses at short notice and not potentially in the new intake of students even having met any of the class uh, previously. Next slide, please. And also looking at um, making sure that all learners have clear instructions; they know who to speak to what they have to deliver. And we're gonna talk about that in, in a couple of slides later, but not just doing what you already do. Um, the fact that you really do have to think differently, not just about lessons, but the whole delivery of um, the program. Next slide, please. And in terms of closer to home, Ofsted have, have recently done a review of online learning and the links at the bottom. And I think the overall view was that FE had re reacted well to the crisis. Um, probably not um, anything surprising here, but um, access, engagement and assessment have been the main challenges for online teaching. And um, this issue around teachers being able to, or not always being uh, checking on the development of learning. And I, and I know that's been a challenge for colleges in that once the lesson's been delivered, how do you then stay in touch with learners to make sure they've either understood things or to understand their next steps. Next slide, please. Staff training obviously has been a big element of, of, of the successful delivery of online learning, making sure people are prepared for and able to understand the differences. Um, but overall, I, I think the summary there was that the experiences of learners have varied considerably across the different prov providers, across subject areas, and across different sort of districts, if you like. Um, and this is something that we haven't got a handle on yet. We, we haven't moved into that sort of um, phase of, um, of seeing where we are. We, we've got plans in place to, to have a look at that in the future. Next slide, please. One thing I picked up in terms of um, monitoring online learning was this star teacher, which is a bit like you know recommendations or star ratings on Amazon or whatever. Um, but it does seem to be quite popular in the emerging uh, Chinese and South Korean uh, e-learning markets. Maybe something that people would want to have a look at. Next slide, please. So moving on to how we might address some of these 
challenges. Um, it has forced people to rethink and innovate. Um, people seem to be in, uh, embracing the change. I think initially colleges and managers were managing the crisis, uh, you know, tr trying to think about the crisis itself rather than managing the crisis in the institution and that developed quite quickly into action. Um, the emotional resilience and leadership skills have obviously been important and that's something to think about for the future. Technology leadership coming to the fore um, managers and leaders having to make quicker decisions. Next slide, please. Um, another thing that's sort of come out through my conversations and some of this research is the measurement of student success and these sort of predetermined metrics. And I've, I've spoken to a few of our colleges about how we may be moving away from attendance, as in people sitting in seats in classrooms to engagement. And I know people are starting to look at that. So that may be something leaders and managers might want to think about. Um, but certainly from this, this article, um, they were reporting that young people are flocking to online degree programmes, and that is likely to become a new normal. Um, online options are much more uh, you know, likely to be taken up, particularly by the new generation of learners. Next slide, please. Uh, this was a previous virtual bridge session, just for, for reference. Um, Southwest College did make, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, quick changes, um, initially because of bad weather events, um, but it did actually turn out to be quite beneficial to um, the, the changes they needed to make uh, when the pandemic hit. So that, that's just a reference to that session. Next slide, please. I'm going to pass over briefly now to John Laird, who's going to go through three slides of experiences, also as it happens from, from North America. So over to you, John. All right. Thanks, colleagues. I thought these were three case studies that I thought might shine a bit of light onto how we might do things a bit differently and use a technology a bit better. Um, the example I'm going to give is about Humber College in Toronto. Uh, Humber College is one of the leading colleges in North America. And they developed a system which was originally called Freshman Integrated Tracking System, just trips off the tongue. And the purpose of that system was to try and identify risk for learners, what things were they likely to struggle with. The idea about predicting the risks it was that you would judge what the risks were and you would put in compulsory interventions to make sure that you dealt with those risks. So what they did, they developed originally 270 questions, which they, they narrowed down. Students would complete these questions in advance, and there were 12 risk areas. Um, one of the risk areas was finance, one was English writing. You know, there, there was a few that were uh, they identified by researching the reasons that, that students left in previous years. When they answer the questions on the risk areas, they're attributed a score. And if that score says um, the risks are written English and finance as two, for example, they would require the student um, to attend a written English class perhaps every Friday morning for 10 weeks as part of the course. If it was finance, they would help them find a part-time job. Uh, they would help them search for grants. But whatever the risk areas were that were identified in the, the predictive system, that was a compulsory part of your program. Uh, the, the Scottish, the, the UK system is quite often a, a response to say, if you want, there's additional support available. Theirs was quite different. They said, here are the risks. We know with confidence these will cause you difficulty. Therefore, part of your program will include uh, mass tutorials or a week doing written English before you start or or whatever that intervention would be. And they used the data from their equivalent of the MIS system to judge the reasons why people left early in the programs and late on the programs and developed questions around those. Once they had the questions, and the questions, when you boiled them down, were fairly simple. Some of the questions were, you know, did you take days off school? Did you hand work in late? Those kinds of questions. But they, they refined those to get the best predictive validity. And I think that the lesson that we can learn from this is about how we use our technology better to predict and intervene where there are risks. 
And that might be the same system we use for blended learning or for campus attendance or for complete distance learning. But the, the key to this story was that the person that led it, Peter Deitch, used data he already had from previous years to develop the model. And the data that he had from previous years was not very different from the data that we have sitting in our MIS systems now. So that idea of predicting risk and requiring interventions was a very successful one for them. In the first year of uh, um, the, the, the use, they, they, they upped their already high uh, PI success rate um, by almost 10%, 9.5%. Um, so that's the kind of intervention we can use our technology better um, to predict and to use successfully to help people complete. Next slide, please, Kenji. The next case study that I want to talk about is Miami-Dade College in Florida. Miami-Dade, um, in 1996, Florida got hit by a hurricane um, and it flattened a lot of the farmlands and whatever. And Miami-Dade College at the time were given a $6 million grant to develop distance learning programs, to research and distance learning. And they've had a lot of finance from private sector and others to do so ever since. I've been fortunate enough to have links with them uh, since then. Um, they started the distance learning programs in 1997 um, and they identified learners who struggled to complete. Uh, one of the interesting things about working with American colleges, the first time I went to Miami-Dade and I, I looked for stats and asked them about retention, they looked at me quizzically and said, what do you mean? And I said, you know, full-time courses, part-time courses, what's the retention rate? Don't know what you're asking me uh, because in their head, the only thing that's important is that they successfully complete. The idea that they attend or attend regularly is, is not significant. And actually there's a real lesson to be learned there about our own flexible and distance learning and our blended learning delivery is that the focus on attendance seems to be the wrong focus. In the American model, people pay their own fees. So sometimes they make class, sometimes they don't. But the important thing is they learn the material and you provide material for them to learn. Um, but what they did try to do was identify learners who struggled to complete and identify the characteristics and the reasons for those who struggled to complete. And there were a few simple big lessons that they uh, learned from that, that they shared across America and other places. Um, the first thing is if it's someone's first post-16 experience in learning, they were very high risk. Now that didn't depend on the level. It didn't matter if they were in our SCQF model level, level four or five or level eight. If it was their first year in learning, they were very high risk. And the second element uh, that they learned was uh, that they had to teach them um, the technical skills and the independent study skills in advance. You can't do that on the hoof. You have to, to do sessions with them uh, to, to make sure they know how to timetable the time, how to research, how to reflect, how to analyze, synthesize. Those are independently taught activities, regardless if it's a, a nursing program or a plumbing program or a bakery program. It's the same idea. You have to develop adult, if I could describe it that way, learning skills and you have to do them formally before you kick off. And by doing that intervention, uh, they had a lot more success. They also had a lot of personal support by tutors. Uh, their equivalent of the, I suppose, learning resource center, uh, you could call it, was called the success center. Uh, and they required people to, to drop in, keep contact with the success center. And the success center was actually staffed by students at the end of their years uh, as students who were paid and their job was to act as mentors and support to do the IT stuff, to do the learning stuff, uh, to do the personal stuff. Uh, and it was a very effective model of making sure that they identified those at risk and had somebody who could intervene early and on a very practical level to make sure that they completed. So I suppose the, the big lessons from Miami-Dade is, is that if you throw people into flexible or distance learning, those underpinning skills have to be taught and they have to be confident in it or, or they're likely not to complete. Next slide please. The last example is a, it's a reasonably current example. Um, 
it's from uh, Bolton College and Bolton, um, it, it's, and I've got to thank JISC for this one for highlighting it. Bolton College have developed uh, a chatbot system called Ada. Uh, and the chatbot system is a system that links with, you can use it on your phone on an app eh, or by using Alexa. And you can ask questions about your course, the program, um, timetables, uh, contacts for finance, that kind of thing. And the chatbot deals with those. Um, and the, the beauty of the Bolton College chatbot model uh, from the literature is the, the simple claim that it is very effective in making sure staff time is used well. It saves a lot of staff time dealing with what can be fairly routine questions. So they developed it in 2019. It's still at quite an early stage. Um, but the chatbot that would deal with general student inquiries that can be accessed in any way, and I suppose the equivalent of my day is, is one way it can be used, um, then you have the potential in that model to save a significant amount of support staff time. And it does mean that the staff who give pastoral support or, or academic support to learners can focus on the more significant or the more challenging questions that learners have. But there's also a, an issue around confidence that a lot of people are quite happy trying to work things out through a chatbot and get original answers uh, so that they don't feel silly when they're asking questions of staff that seem to be quite routine. Um, there is a, a small video uh, that lasts a couple of minutes that explains it. And there are there's a couple of links on the news sites and, and there's a JISC link that will tell you a little more about the, the chatbot developed for Bolton College. Thanks, I'll pass back to Ian. Thank you, John. So the early slides in this presentation, we're looking at um, you know, very briefly what was out there, what's happening, and essentially we're, we're all pretty much in the same boat. Um, and those those links there um, will help maybe help you to explore a bit more, particularly about what's happening in, in North America, which for my brief look at this seemed to be certainly thinking about what happens next, what happens after the pandemic, rather than particularly measuring what's happening at present or what has happened in the last nine months. So next slide, please, Kenji. One thing's for certain, there's gonna be more disruption ahead. So we're just in the recovery phase from this pandemic. I would imagine it might not be, maybe not another pandemic, but certainly future issues, whether they're weather related or health related or, or whatever, IT related, Brexit related possibly. There's the uncertainty at the moment over Scottish independence. And not only are economies trying to recover financially, but institutions, and in particular our colleges in Scotland, are under quite significant um, financial pressure. Next slide, please. So in terms of trying to summarise what's happening or happened so far, it's, it's clear that a lot of the things that were going to happen have been accelerated by COVID-19, particularly in, the, in relation to the delivery of online and remote learning. Um, the needs of learners have certainly changed and I'm sort of proposing that this has created a, a new generation. They were probably on the, on the cusp anyway, but certainly will be an irreversible cultural shift because once you've started to offer these types of options, I think it will be very difficult to go back from. People will want more and better of, of these sort of online and remote learning options. But certainly we've seen advantages in terms of accessibility for some learners that have had a, a difficulty attending in person. And as John mentioned there, maybe contacting uh, staff either for support or for learning matters, you know, through email or through different methods and not raising it in the class. Potentially, arguably one of the disadvantages might be there's no more snow days as we've had in the past. But if we go to the next slide, please. One thing I just wanted to reflect on is that in this sort of rush to return back to normal, everybody wants to get back to normal in, in one way or another. It may be worth reflecting on just what parts of the previous normal are worth rushing back to. And using the time now, as we start to you know, prepare for the next academic year, 21-22, um, um, you know, consider what parts do we want to go back to? Do we want to go back to everybody attending classes, as John was just mentioning there? Um, do we want to keep this mixture of models? Um, and how far do we want to go? And how far indeed do we need to go in terms of trying to make ends meet financially? 
So the next slide, please. So in these last couple of slides, I've tried to think about um, how uh, you know, these challenges have affected, say, IT. Um, certainly what was coming through in, the, in what I looked at is that um, communication with learners is, is going to be absolutely core because you don't have them or gather, you can't gather them in a, a location and talk to lots of learners necessarily at the same time. You can do it online, but that obviously hasn't got the same impact as, as being in the room. Um, so there's less opportunities to communicate physically. And it may need that colleges have to create more and different approaches to reaching and informing, that's quite important, potential and current learners with visuals becoming even more important as well. So this is about if you haven't um, sort of advertised the fact or informed potential learners about what's coming even next year in terms of what the, the delivery modes might be like and how long they might last, that's maybe something to be considering just now. And our current generation aren't sort of heavy users of email or Twitter, so what platforms will be used to communicate with them? Certainly adoption of hybrid learning spaces, which means that you know people uh, may come into the building either for physical, practical classes and or access facilities of their own in their own time and their own accord and or you know remotely. But certainly this whole mixture of delivery is going to have to be thought about um, going forward. Next slide, please. In terms of efficiencies, obviously the, the potentially there would be efficiencies around the physical estate. They often take a long time to, to uh, realize in terms of leases or, or buildings, etc. But I've certainly picked up this, uh, you know, many colleges have, have distributed IT and software and Wi-Fi packs, et cetera, to learners who weren't able to access uh, online learning. Um, but there's a consideration there of, as we know, supporting both the staff and those learners. So you might move from IT support for 300 staff to IT support for you know, 15,000 learners potentially. That, that's something that maybe needs to be thought through. In terms of leading and managing, um, I think it's clear that the new generation of learners, certainly now they've started to sample this method of delivery um, will be very comfortable with online and hybrid methods. But uh, certainly looking at curriculum portfolios, we talked about the length of programs in earlier slides, learning delivery types will all need to be thought through, redefined, and then as I've mentioned, advertised or informed to, this, to the new learners. But um, active transformational leadership is obviously gonna be quite critical. So I think it would be worth investing time um, within colleges and with our colleagues and partners to think about how institutions will be led and managed in the future. Uh, we're just coming to the end of the formal part, the recorded part. I'll just pass back to John briefly before we move into the next session. But at the end of this slide pack, there's a couple of other slides on managing remote teams, which I thought I'd just leave you with. So the aim of this these slides have been to, to sort of hopefully make you think about where you might need to be looking and give you some links to follow some of these um, elements up. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for your attention, colleagues, and thank you, Ian. As Ian indicated, uh, that's the end of the presentation element uh, on the topic of learning from international experience. Um, and for those who are here in, in physical attendance, well, in virtual attendance, but in, in real time, uh, we're going on to uh, have discussion, uh, raise any issues, questions, and share your own experience. For those watching on YouTube, thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation.